Hello, everyone, and welcome to the afternoon, um, day two of um, CSCon. Uh, my name is Kwame. We have an amazing lineup for you this afternoon, and uh, we can't get way ready to get started. Um, first off, we're going to have uh, Jonathan Victor from Protocol Labs. Um, a quick bio on Jonathan. He works across uh, product and business development type protocol. And prior to protocol, he worked across finance, con uh, consumer packaged goods, industrial manufacturing, telecom, and the airline industry. His talk will be on bridging web two to web three, scaling to petabyte uh, scale storage. Hey, Jonathan. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for that. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Are you ready, bud? I think so. Can you All see right. that? Icon? I'll drop. Awesome. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, so yeah, I actually slightly modified the, the title for this talk, um, though I think both are roughly true. Um, yeah, so bridging Web 2 to Web 3, uh, one of the most important problems that we have. Uh, I've renamed it to enabling internet scale storage, but truthfully, this is both one and the same. Uh, but maybe you'll see why I sort of wanted to go this other direction in a second. Um, so maybe to kick off, it, it might be useful just to give some background on Filecoin. Uh, so Filecoin is a decentralized storage network. Uh, you sort of see our mission statement here, where the goal is to build a storage network that's designed to store humanity's most important information. In order to do that, we need something that can operate at the scale of literally the internet, which we view as one of the most important resources just for all of humanity and upgrading knowledge. Um, and so Filecoin itself uh, launched a little over a year ago. If we sort of play back what's happened, uh, the way you can sort of think of Filecoin is first, it's an open storage market where anyone can offer storage capacity to the network. The network itself is cryptographically enforcing an SLA that says, hey, if you as a client come to purchase storage services off this network, we're going to make sure there's some level of quality of surface proofs. We enforce that through our crypto economic model, but you as a client can then interoperate with anyone who's op offering these storage services. And it's really like an Airbnb of storage. Uh, in this last year, uh, actually this slide is out of date as well. I made this about a week ago. Uh, we've onboarded now close to 15 ebibytes of storage. And if we wanted to contextualize that, uh, it goes like gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, ebibytes. So 13, 15 ebibytes of storage. That's about like 150 CERNs. Uh, so like quite a lot of data capacity. Um, so really store like aiming for like, how do we enable storage on the, the supply side? Um, and as a result of that, we've also gotten a super low cost of storage. Uh, you can sort of see on the slide, I pulled this from a site that pulls publicly off the chain. The average price of a deal is something like scientific notation per terabyte per year. Um, and so the, re the reason I give all this context is I think we're sort of at this cool inflection point where especially in Web3, we've seen a ton of adoption uh, in the last year, especially for things like net NFTs. Now gaming and metaverse use cases are really popping up. We're seeing traditional Web2 companies like startups pivoting to look a lot more closely at how do Web3 use cases sort of make sense for the business models. We're also seeing companies like now Meta uh, sort of like pivoting and sort of recognizing and uh, giving more legitimacy to the space. And the idea that, hey, these like public infrastructure systems that we have can be useful. Um, and so even just using these two very uh, rough heuristics, there's two public services that Protocol Labs runs, Web3.storage, NFT.storage, and you can sort of see what this looks like from an adoption side where it's just everything is like up into the right in terms of like how much are people trying to like move to Web3. Um, but what's interesting is when we think about what those use cases look like, a lot of them are very like Web3 native. Uh, and specifically, they fall into these like very specific tracks of NFTs as sort of a medium. People then sort of like expand in different ways of what NFTs could be. Uh, so that's like going from pictures to videos to like AR and VR assets. Um, so like metaverse, where I think that's still like kind of undefined in how people are approaching it, but some mixture of AR and VR, like 3D, like museums, things like that. Um, but like they all sort of fit a similar mold. And what's interesting is the tools that we're building that we want to enable for Web3 are not limited just to this like new category of use case. We also want to eventually bring these tools and these technologies also backport it to traditional companies, traditional organizations that are also thinking about where like when they are purely looking at technology choice, uh, comparing like the cloud to decentralized storage. Um, so today what I actually wanted to talk about is a little bit more about my experiences, especially in the last few months, talking to folks uh, more from the traditional side 
and trying to educate them about Web3. Uh, so really just highlighting like, what are the challenges that I've sort of seen in the field um, and where that sort of lands, both on the education side, where there's room for us as like a community to really push the ball forward and helping bring Web3 to a different set of users that aren't just looking at it for NFTs, but also looking at it in just more traditional contexts. But then also highlighting where there's like technical areas where there's just challenges to actually build the sort of use cases that may, we may want to and where there are opportunities for us as a community to sort of build more and do more. Um, so maybe to talk a little bit about the educational challenges, I think one of the things that's interesting is Web3 today is definitely like still in the very early days, although we have a lot of like the core primitives in place, although we have a lot of really powerful tools, it still hasn't met the parity of like Amazon S3 or like having compute next to storage, like all of these things that people sort of expect. And so what I've discovered at least is when we're trying to think about how we can scale to get more and more teams that are building in this space, it requires an understanding of what are their pain points and what are the things that Web3 uniquely can offer and enable for their businesses. Um, simply just building things and hoping people will come, obviously never like the best solution. Uh, maybe you'll find like some like true believers that will come and those people can be helpful. But I think thinking strategically also about what are the tools and the munitions that we can build to really solve for common case use, what, or use cases, but also just lower the barrier of entry. Um, I think if we sort of think of like the normal adoption curve of like, you have like your early adopters, you have like, uh, like middle uh, stage and then you have like late adopters. I think one of the early sort of observations here is inside of the Web3 community, we have all of these people who see the future who are willing to like sort of eat glass in order to make this stuff work and build the tools that will make it easier for other folks uh, to adopt. And there's certain places where like being able to dive in together with some of these Web2 institutions, we can actually convert them into those types of early adopters if we can help share some of the vision. Um, so I think one of the early things that I sort of realized is there's a huge gap when people hear Web3, they sort of like have this like filter in their brain and just trying to like break down what are the places where it's not decentralization for the sake of decentralization, it's focusing in on what are things that may be a challenge, whether it's cost pain points, whether it's literally just like fear about lock-in with a specific service provider, any of these like, challenges, just identifying what those things are and being able to communicate specifically to them um, I think this goes in a little bit to the second point where each org has a different pain point. I think the places where the cloud has traditionally really done well uh, has been in like very enterprisey contexts. Uh, but when you start looking uh, a little bit closer, you recognize that there's actually like a long tail of use cases that are quite important that have been underserved. And we'll talk about a few of them in a second. Um, but this is actually the place where I think Web3 uniquely because of how it's architected as public infrastructure has an opportunity to really fill a niche. Uh, and where like we potentially as a community can go evangelize. Um, and then I think the last thing is really just understanding where people are coming from. I think Web2 today, one of the problems is if you haven't really gone down the crypto rabbit hole, if you haven't really looked at these technologies for yourself, I think a lot of folks just sort of like see everything sort of as like one unified brush. I think there can be skepticism about like, what is, is it all just sort of like Ponzi schemes, whatever else. And so identifying like where are the places where one, we can help convince them otherwise, or two, enable them to run low risk experiments where they can sort of just touch the metal, see for themselves. And then once you're able to like align around things that are actually providing value for them, uh, we can like drive a wedge through that and grow it from there. Um, of course, all of these are really on the educational side where it's like more of like, how do you solve the people side of this problem? If we really wanna to get to like mass, mass adoption, it's not just about building the right technologies, it's about convincing the humans that are like, building those technologies to also adopt. And so I think really on the educational side, these are probably the high level things that I've taken away. Um, but I think one of the more interesting things also is going through this effort of trying to get like a bunch of different organizations to start just throwing massive data sets into Filecoin. Uh, there's tons of technical challenges uh, that I think get a little bit <laughs> under the hood and it really highlights where there are opportunities to build up more and more infrastructure. Um, so one of the things that sort of came up here for us at least was identifying how we can translate uh, basically the tooling that enables people to just like plug into their existing infrastructure. Um, I think this comes in a number of forms. A lot of times people think uh, just purely just like an S3 API is all things or the only thing people need. But when you start talking to these different teams, it really gets into the weeds of like, what is their full data management lifecycle? For some of them, they have data movers and other like integration points. 
and finding out like what is the actual weeds of their business? How does it operate? Where are places where it will make sense to just dump things out to Web3 to get the same sort of archiving or the same sort of like storage layers with the right guarantees that they might be expecting um, on top of uh, maybe the more higher order of things like S3 interfaces that can uh, enable uh, enable easier integration as well. The other thing that was also interesting that sort of came out is storing large amounts of data is quite different if we're trying to really get to like J-shaped adoption curves. It's quite different uh, than I think many people might realize where once you start talking about petabytes of data and really trying to store large, large volumes, you run into a bunch of different problems, including just traditional internet problems of how do you even move petabytes of data around? And so it sort of highlights also where, where there's room for more expertise to be built. Um, we've actually had community members sort of step up in this way to help figure out some of these problems, where if you're trying to like move a petabyte of data, it actually can be more effective to just ship hard drives. Being able to do that effectively then also requires building tooling to make sure that you have the right data integrity. You can still maintain like trustless properties throughout this like life cycle of this process. But it really just shows that the supply chain of what we're talking about can get really, really deep in the weeds. Um, and then the last thing that was sort of interesting that popped up as a, as a challenge was identifying what are the different retrieval flows that people really want and how we can lower the barrier of entry there. Um, people have built, started building tools around this, things like Estuary that use hybrids of IPFS and Filecoin to really tackle both of these together. Um, but as a result of this, we're seeing places where, although Filecoin has like more room to improve as things like the retrieval market are built out, there's other tools that can fill the gap and provide value today. Um, so that was, that was a lot, but maybe I'll talk about some of the teams that we've been working with and some of the cool things that they're enabling, because I think it can also potentially inspire some of the ideas where there might be more other applications that can be driven as well. Um, so I've classified these into two groups. Uh, I call some of these Web 2.5 and some of these Web 3. Uh, Web 2.5 is really just taking traditional organizations and getting them to dip their toes into the waters of Web 3. Um, it doesn't mean that they've moved wholesale over, but it's finding use cases where there's places where Web 3 is kind of uniquely positioned to provide value. Um, so the first one maybe I'll talk about is uh, with a bunch of researchers from the Max Planck Institution, from Columbia University, um, also some of the folks who like run Conda. Uh, really, this actually started as sort of an accidental thing. Um, so in the climate community, there's a data format called ZAR. Uh, this is like a multi-dimensional multi array format. Uh, and it's used quite commonly to basically like capture when you do like a field study, you have like location data, you have all the sensor data that you have, you have a bunch of different parameters. ZAR is just a file format that's commonly used for analysis, uh, for like structuring the data for analysis. Um, and what's interesting is in the climate community, you have this like multi-tenant problem where you have like NOAA, which is a government organization in the US, they have petabytes of data that they make openly available but every institution separately will go do their own field study. They'll collect their own data. And there's a question of who offered, like how do we make this data more accessible? And so like one solution to that problem is the sort of like manual peer to peer thing. This is actually what many of the researchers do where they will like send data to each other on hard drives or they'll like ship it over the web in different forms. Um, but that has its own level of fragility of like who makes sure that there's always going to be a copy of this stuff if we want like a corpus of all this knowledge. Of course, the other option is then maybe we would just put it all in the cloud. There's actually an initiative to do this called Pangeo Forge. Um, but then there's a different question of who pays for all the storage. Uh, and especially if we're talking about something that's collected from like 40 different research universities that are all like working collaboratively together, like who fits the bill for like the storage costs, who fits the bill for like the bandwidth costs. And especially when all of these institutions have their own latent capacity, are there ways that we could better use this? So the big idea and the interesting insight where Filecoin and IPFS potentially have an opportunity to help here is we have these massive data sets that all are like accessed by like this global community and using something like Filecoin, we can actually allow each individual university to sort of pick and choose where they wanna operate on the spectrum of like consumer or supplier. Um, if they have data sets that they want to offer to the network, they could host it themselves. They could also just push it to this scaling solution that we have of public infrastructure of an open provider market um, and then you have copies of the data that can be persisted with verifiable proof. So it's not like we have to over replicate data because we know who has what copy of the underlying data set. But more importantly, you can also allow folks to share their bandwidth by using things like IPFS. So you can use something like Estuary, which is like a hybrid IPFS and Falcon node 
to say each institution can like pull back and cache parts of the data sets that are being actively used. And then instead of having people pay for bandwidth, like pulling it off of a miner every time, if researchers are actively working on data sets, they can collaboratively share it with each other using things like IPFS. And so here you can see on the right how they're sort of taking a stab at this, where they've taken the czar data file format, basically written a translation layer uh, in order to convert those into like Merkle DAGs for IPFS, and then pipeline to push these things into Filecoin, have an index, things like that. And then inside of Conda, where they have this library where they do all their analysis, they can use IPFS to actually just be the hash reference for pulling back data sets. And this has a subtle, also interesting other side benefit where all the analysis that they're doing becomes somewhat repeatable, where when you use IPFS, you get this fingerprint of the content. You can use that as sort of like a way of knowing deterministically how to reproduce the analysis that someone had versus like John's CSV1 or John's czar data file one. Um, so this to me is like a really interesting idea where you have this like multi-tenant problem of many different people generating data sets using uh, public open networks to store this data in a way that makes it accessible, doing it at a price point that's insanely cheap, allowing research institutions to collaboratively use their resources to share and like distribute data um, is something that's totally, I don't think possible in any other form where there's like already investments in HPCs and we can leverage that infrastructure to make for a more open web. A sort of separate uh, and different uh, interesting use case that's been popping off uh, kind of recently is we've been working with the USC Shoah Foundation and the Starling Lab. Um, and so this highlights a different function of uh, Filecoin storage, at least, where the, the USC Shoah Foundation, they preserve evidence of genocide. Um, so they make video testimonials. These are things that range from like the Holocaust to basically like the Guatemalan genocide. Literally, all of these atrocious acts that have happened. And the reason that they create these testimonies is to make sure that no one can go back later and say, oh, this didn't happen. Like the idea that you could deny it becomes much more difficult if you have physical evidence of in like testimony of what actually happened. Of course, the, the concern is you don't want people to say that these are like doctored images, doctored videos, things like that. And Filecoin uniquely offers like these proofs that give you a chain of custody that says, this is the original data set that I was given and it hasn't been modified over time. And so by combining those two things, along with like large scale and cheap storage, you have these ways of creating like a verifiable archive, um, which also people can permissionlessly hook into um, and offer additional capacity to, which from the perspective of how do we make sure that like these facts are known and facts are preserved, uh, we have a way of doing that in an immutable state. The last one I'll touch on in the Web 2.5 uh, sort of category here is actually working with the Internet Archive. Um, this is one that's kind of interesting where the Internet Archive is sort of like, I think, the traditional answer to, oh, well, who stores the Internet's data? Um, but when we start thinking about resiliency and how do we enable this content to be persisted longer than any one institution, this is where Web3 potentially has some ability to help. Uh, when things are stored on IPFS and Filecoin, it can still be sponsored by an individual, by an institution, but you can also create endowments and DAOs and things like that to have like pools of capital that are programmatically using those funds to continue the ongoing storage and preservation of these data assets. Um, so we're working with them. Uh, they're starting to move parts of their archive over, um, starting with this end of term uh, web crawl data. And then maybe the, on the Web3 side, there's a couple that I think are interesting. And I think this is another way of thinking about how do we scale to new use cases, to new things outside of just like NFTs and just like metaverse. And this isn't to, I spent a lot of time thinking about this too, but really just highlighting like we're at the precipice of where these technologies can be used. And so really interesting and compelling ways that people are tackling this. Um, so one I wanted to highlight here was Absentia. Um, so this is a DAO that's working on building a scientific ecosystem to better enable uh, data collaboration, coordination, uh, and democratize funding. So primarily actually Absentia is trying to be a science DAO where people can pull funds, they can have researchers that are working together in a more community-driven way, but you can use decentralized file storage as a resource for enabling access for things like open science. Um, so when we start thinking just like the czar data sets, how do we make sure that we have access to this like fundamental foundational knowledge? The cool thing that we have with Web3 is the ability to have uh, these like programmatic ways of funding, uh, commu more community-driven uh, incentivized models for actually sustainably keeping these data sets alive and making sure that they're being made accessible for others as well. 
Um, so the cool thing that they're doing here is uh, they're actually working more directly with like the scientific community, the entire, like the founding team of Absentia, that's like the core working group. They actually all are all like ex PhDs, scientists. Some of them came straight out of university. Um, and so they're working pretty hard to like start with neuroscience. They're pushing Dandy is like the first data set that they're working with. But really the goal is to move to how do we create sustainable funding models for all of open science. Then the last one, which is actually pretty cool as well, uh, that I'm going to talk about is GameForest. Um, so GameForest is a decentralized fund for artificial intelligence used to measure and reward sustainable natured stewardship. But the way that you can think about this is it's, it's a smart contract on Ethereum where funds are paid out when there's proof that some action has been taken. And the way that they can generate the proof is by uh, basically taking these satellite images to see like in a specific geography, has uh, like climate, uh, like has like the local ecology approved and they can do that using AI and they can generate proof, not only of the model that was used, but also the output images and soon hopefully the image or the input images as well that they can create IPFS hashes for and stick those in the smart contract as proof of uh, proof of action that then can be used to pay out uh, from this like uh, from this DAO that they're creating. Um, and so from there, it's an interesting way of thinking about how do we think about different forms of capital formation to enable action. And when you have the ability to have sto like storage that can actually operate at like terabytes, hopefully like petabytes for this use case specifically, at uh, petabyte scale, you can actually include the entire chain of custody from input to transformation to output uh, to allow for like full verifiability that the correct actions are being taken. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll pause there. I think the thing that's interesting here, if I was to summarize where we've sort of gone, is a lot of the efforts that we've made so far in really trying to push forward, uh, how do we get more and more people to adopt in Web3 is to think about category expansion, where how do we drive new use cases, whether it's on the Web2 front, working with specific institutions that may not understand where Web3 totally fits in, but there is value add where we can help sort of bridge the gap is like, thinkers about and like builders in the space between what they want to do and what the technology can do today, as well as folks like in the game forest side and uh, in the Absentia side, who are just finding new use cases, even inside of Web3 and tying together all of these separate threads to enable new things that aren't currently as, uh, I think, as adopted as hopefully soon they will be in the future, but really also having these teams push the boundaries on how do we make the barrier of entry lower and lower so more of these things can spring up. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll pause there. Uh, that was a lot of talking. Um, yeah, I would love to take any questions if there's any questions from the crowd. Great, that was an amazing uh, presentation. Learned a lot. We do have some questions. So the first one from Anonymous, in terms of technology, what applications does Web3 still struggle with in comparison to Web2? Yeah, I think it depends on your definition here. So. I think if you think of Web3 as sort of like this all-encompassing thing of like verifiability, I think some of the challenges really come down to like if you're doing uh, like pure peer-to-peer -peer things uh, or if you're doing like cryptographic things, there's like an additional cost that you're paying compared to if you were just storing something on a server, like you don't have to do any like proof that you're doing anything. And so I think there the challenge becomes much more like a technical complexity challenge where like in order to set up the trustless version of that thing, there's a lot of additional steps that you have to do. And so you have different teams that are building tools that make that much easier. So like Estuary is a really good example. The textile team has built something called BidBot that also helps there too. But really it's just looking at these protocols as being very, very low level. And so how do we build up to the experiences that people sort of expect? Like when you stick something in S3, you don't really think about like, all the DevOps work that's happening behind the scenes that Amazon's doing to get you to like the 99.999 whatever percent resilience they, they say. Uh, that's the sort of stuff where like the protocol today is like really, really low level. And so building up all these higher order services to make it more and more easy. Um, so I think, yeah, to, to sort of summarize, uh, where does Web3 struggle in comparison to Web2? I think the, the cost of trustlessness is still quite high. And I think the things that help are we have economic models that can help subsidize that cost. And that's where like, even though uh, like storing on a Filecoin today, uh, it's it can handle large capacity, you can do it at an incredibly cheap price point. It's much more complicated uh, than just storing on like normal Amazon storage. And so I think there it requires like people who are willing to take that hurdle to make that work. 
Um, so that's where I would say like, there's more of a struggle. It's like, we just need to get the UX way, way better on all of this stuff. Awesome. Okay. Uh, second question. What are the largest pain points collectively for people hesitant about mi migrating from web two to web three? Which one should we tackle first? Costs, DevX, UX, and keys, mnemonics, et cetera. Yeah, I think it really varies. So one of the funny conversations I had with one of these universities that I was talking to was they were, I was talking to like the head of their IT department. He's actually super excited about it. And he was like going through procurement and trying to convince them about like, we're going to manage crypto and keys and all of that. It's just like a conversation that we're not ready for. And I think the big opportunity to like onboard a lot of these orgs actually is just enable them to do stuff without having to get as in the weeds where like with trustless primitives, we can actually build a lot of the services that they need where they can like use IPFS, things like that, create fingerprints uh, of their content. They can push stuff to Filecoin, but if they can do it through someone who's like helping set up the deal for them, uh, you can use like an aggregator or something else. Like you can sort of like get to the point where you create value. And once you create value, you can have that conversation with like procurement. So I'd say like the main things that we need to do is just really focus in on where are places where like, uh, yeah, we can like, I would say simplify the UX as much as possible. Cause I think my pathing of the best way to convince people make the UX as easy as possible. They'll onboard, they'll derive value. Once they derive value, we can convince all of the other like people in that chain, like here's why you should do X, Y, and Z thing, including like care about managing keys. There's always going to be more people pushing the ball forward on things like more intuitive hardware devices, things like that. Um, but I think up until we can get them to just experience the Delta of saying like, look, you want to switch providers from like X thing to Y thing, and you don't have to change anything in your app. It just kind of works. Like that's the sort of thing that I think can really make a big difference or helping them see the value of here's like verifiable proofs that give you the ability to like, say, if this thing goes down, how do I automatically just trigger another copy of that data to be there? Um, there's like a lot of things there where it's just like this, the core value props uh, really just needs to shine through first. And then once they like see the light, so to speak, it's easier to them be like, okay, cool. We can take the training wheels off and you can like manage more and more stuff yourself. Um, next question. Um, provenance of data, information, and news source is an increasingly critical issue, especially when it comes to misinformation. How is following IPFS helping when it comes to that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think Falcon and IPFS are partial answers to this question. They are not the complete answer. I think the thing that they both offer, so each of them offers different primitives, and those primitives can be combined with other primitives in order to get to like the full knowledge graph that I think we sort of want. Like, I think for a lot of these things, part of the problem is we have like different state about like what was said, when was it said, all of that detail. And the cool thing with something like Filecoin is we're able to push things into like a blockchain and we can say with proofs, like we can see like, this is when this asset was created. This thing hasn't been modified. If someone's debating the veracity of an image or like a video, like we can actually see, and like, especially with there's special phones now. Um, this is actually a thing the Starling Lab is also working on. But there's like phones that can have like, uh, they have like uh, keys embedded on them where you can like sign pictures as they're being taken. So you can imagine literally having verifiability from like the generation of an asset to like the storage and the chain of custody as that data moves over time. With something like proof of space time, we actually can see that. And so like the combination of these things doesn't tell you anything more about like the veracity of something. And I think this really gets trickier when you start realizing that much, much of misinformation is like selective truth. But the thing that it gives you is like a paper trail of like, what is the provenance of all of these assets over time? How are they generated? Who generated them? All of this. And so you can start doing meta analysis on that sort of stuff. And when you start thinking about like a knowledge graph, you're able to then say, if someone has built up an index of this stuff, you could actually trace and say like, okay, so this is like what the history of these things are. You can like say who generated these things. Ideally, you could also like imagine a world where you can like look around and see like all the different things that they've generated. Um, so I think like these primitives are super important. Um, there are teams, there is a researcher at Protocol Labs who's working, uh, Joel Gustafson on knowledge graph work, uh, also with MIT on the underlay project. Um, so these are things that we think about and we see IPFS creating like these verifiable references as being critical for that. And then Filecoin offering these proofs, both of like 
what is what data was entered when and how has it like been like kept uh, over time as being like crucial components and or enable to enable that higher order like knowledge graph type thing. Awesome. Um, next question: Does file calling integrate a permission layer as of right now? Uh, once you have the CID, anyone can access the data. Does file uh, does Filecoin integrate permissions? So Filecoin doesn't have a permissions layer right now, but I think this would be a great idea if someone is interested in building it. Um, this is like the sort of thing, there are teams that are working on things that are sort of similar to this. Um, so the Kiko team has built something called Nevermind. There's like a bunch of different stats of the Apple, but I think this is a really important problem. Um, Filecoin itself as like a base protocol is pretty unopinionated. Our view is if you let users choose, then they can sort of define how they want to like build all the higher order services on top. But again, uh, this goes back to my previous point where it's like, Filecoin is like all the way down here. Like it is a super low level protocol. And so I think the thing that we want is to build more and more of these services that sit on top where, yeah, permissioning is a really important use case. I think today Filecoin most easily does very private data, like encrypt, erase your code, do all the stuff. So like it is hard to read unless you know all of the information about the thing you're trying to get as well as it does very public data really well. Um, but doing that in between requires more design, um, which it's not impossible, but hasn't been built yet. Uh, next question from Tippy Five Star. From your many conversations and experience, what's a real world metaphor analogy uh, for how IPFS Filecoin works that helps non-technical people bridge the knowledge gap? Yeah, so I always start with IPFS because I think it helps motivate everything. And for IPFS, I always use this analogy where it's like, if we were talking about a book, so if Kwame and I were talking and I'm like, hey, do you want to read To Kill a Mockingbird? It's my favorite book. And he says, yes. And then I tell him, okay, great. You should like fly to London. If you go to London and the center of town is a library, third bookshelf on the right, two books in, that's the book that you want. That's how the internet works today. And there's like many things that could go wrong. Kwame could be denied from going on his flight. The library could burn down. A different book could be there. The book could just be missing altogether. These are all things that happen in the internet today. And like, clearly like, that's like not a great way of describing like, what is the book that I want Kwame to read? Instead, what if I told him though, hey, To Kill a Mockingbird, it's written by Harper Lee. It's got this many pages. Here's the ISBN number. Here's the cover art. Well, Kwame could ask anyone for that copy of that book. He could ask me, he could ask you, Tippy. He could ask anyone. And whoever has the closest copy of the book could hand it back to him. And like, this is the difference between HTTP and IPFS, where HTTP is saying, hey, I want to get some content from some specific location, whereas IPFS is saying, hey, internet, I just want some content. And so like, then once, hopefully if that resonates with folks, um, usually I go from that to, okay, cool. So IPFS does this really cool thing where it solves this like one to N problem, where it says, if there's between one and N copies of this book, because Kwame can ask me and I can ask a friend, so long as there's a pathway of like Kwame asking me to like whoever actually has it, eventually he'll get the book, it'll come back and it'll all be great. But unfortunately, if no one has the book, then there's no way he'll get the book back. And so this is where Filecoin comes in uh, as a cryptographic protocol uh, that enables guarantees around someone being like incentivized to keep that book around. Um, and so that's where Filecoin, usually I then sort of like pivots, like Filecoin is just a blockchain, it cryptographically enforces an SLA. And then I describe it more as like Airbnb for, uh, for storage, where it's like anyone can offer storage capacity to the network and the network just enforces some minimum quality of service. Um, and so between those two that typically lands, but yeah, usually I like try to pause in between so people can like drill in and I can just clarify as we go. Okay, um, what is the development roadmap for Filecoin? What are the future major developments? There is a lot, man. Um, so I would say the two things that are probably really interesting to me. So the first is, uh, it's called the Filecoin virtual machine. Uh, so basically like enabling smart contracts on Filecoin. Um, the approach that's being taken is like a hypervisor approach. So there will hopefully be many VMs in the future. So like EVM, like a WASM one, maybe even a JS one, we'll see. Um, but the idea with smart contracts on Filecoin is our goal is to enable sort of like, I mean, as I said at the top, like how do we preserve all this information? And Filecoin today is like very like 
deal-based and it should be deal-based where it's like, here's a term where I deterministically can say your content is persisted. But if I want to do more interesting things, like I want to be able to say as a miner, I know you're a very good miner. So I want to offer you a cheaper cost of capital. So you don't have to put up like the full amount of collateral because that's really expensive. Well, I can't do that easily. Like we're actually having to like solve this with partners today where like we have to go find centralized providers that are willing to go work with all of these different people to like provide loans to make that happen. And that's a really difficult thing to do. Like if you're a small miner, you now have to go work with an intermediary in order to like go borrow or like buy Filecoin in order to like be able to offer that collateral to the network. Uh, so instead you could imagine a mechanism where what's if instead you did something closer to like Lido where it's like, if you are an investor or you are willing to make or like put up capital, you can pull your capital into a fund. Like my, we have the best way of telling a miner's quality, which is a cryptographic ledger of all of their interactions and how well they performed. And so like you get like perfect credit scoring of like how high quality are miners. And so like a smart contract can allow for better capital efficiency, but it also can allow for things like, how do I automatically have a smart contract that runs and says, like, I always want to make sure there's five copies of my data here. Without having to need an Oracle, you directly can read off the chain things like, what are the deal states of these different things? So you can like do a lot of stuff very natively without having to like actually like pay a bunch of additional fees. So to me, I think like smart contracts is like one of the biggest unlocks, uh, really just from like a utility perspective, where it's like, I want to have data that's stored indefinitely. Like that is doable with a smart contract in my view. Um, so to me, that's like one of the most important updates. I think the other is probably on the retrieval market side, whether I know there's a bunch of teams that are really thinking about how do we improve uh, just like the quality of retrieval. The Falcoin protocol has specified even from like the early white paper days, like there'll be a storage market, there'll be a retrieval market. And on the retrieval side, you can start envisioning what like a distributed CDN sort of looks like. This idea, especially if you're able to go between storage and retrieval of like, how do I just dump money into also with smart contracts, dump money into a smart contract and just say like, here's a pile of cash that can go do DeFi things to generate yield, but that yield can be used to fund both the storage and potentially the retrieval of my data. Um, so I think like both of these like angles, they're like very big chunks of work, but I think like the space of what you can build just like explodes massively um, when you have these two new like dimensions that you can operate on. Um, next question. Um, why and how, why and how come trustless primitives can create such a friendly and inclusive community? Um, so I think there's probably many answers to this question. So I'll give you my version of it, which is, I think it helps align people around like, what are our shared values and like, what are the things and like the shared values where it's like, what are the things that we sort of want our technology to enforce by default? And I think like trustless, the irony of the word trustless is I think it, uh, it sort of like, uh, demarcates the line of like, what is the, what is the technology enforcing versus like, what are like humans enabling? And so I, I think you could look at DAOs as like a really interesting example of this is like a DAO, although there might be smart contracts involved is still very much like a human thing, but like at the base layer, we have like a very clear line of like what the technology is going to enforce. And so to me, I think it like more emphasizes like the human side of everything, which is why, like, I don't know, to me, at least that's where it's not like we're expecting the computer to do more. It like puts the onus on us as a community to like build the things that we want. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if that's everyone's answer, but that, that would be my answer. <laughs> and the, the last question, um, how far are we from school, uh, full scale adoption of IPFS? Will HTTP always be around? It's a good cue. Um, I think I, I actually don't have a great answer for you. I think it will be a while to get like the full, full adoption that we really want. Like we want every browser eventually to like have support for IPFS. And I think doing that is like, you have to convince a bunch of, and there's people who are working on that. So like folks like Dietrich, but like in order to get that to happen, it's like, there's like committees of people, there's like external groups, some of whom are like crypto skeptical and web three skeptical. And so like, there is just like a social consensus thing where it's like, we really have to keep pushing to like educate people and make them understand like, what is the actual value prop of these things. Um, but I think like, as I am blown away with how far things have come, even I've been at protocol labs for two and a half years. And like in that time we've gotten like brave opera 
and like you slowly are seeing more and more of this happen and like these conversations are like just becoming easier so like I, I can't give a great answer to like what does full-scale adoption even mean but like the thing I sort of see is like the desire to have these conversations and the fact that we have so much enthusiasm around this space is making the conversations easier and easier which I think means that there's just like acceleration um so the second part of this question of like, will HTTP always be around? Yeah, I'm actually not a maximalist in that sense. Like my view is like, I have I use people who have talked to me before will have probably seen me do this thing with like three axes before, where it's like my view of web three is not like some people, sometimes people describe it as like web one was eaten by web two and then web two will get eaten by web three. And like, I actually don't see it being that way. The way I sort of see it is like, we have like different dimensions of like, web one is like read which is one axis web two is like read and then write is like two axes and like every application we've had is like operated in this like two-dimensional plane and like now we have this third dimension of like verifiability trustlessness whatever you want to call it and like the thing that's interesting is that gives you this like new efficient frontier that's like a curve as a surface not just like a two-dimensional line and like to me that's where there are applications where http may make sense and like will continue to be used um, but I do think the ver verifiability is the part where I think we'll probably see more and more things that have like CIDs and like IPLD like hashes, just because it provides interoperability with all of these other ecosystem tools that people are building. And so I think as that sort of like snowballs, we'll see more and more of it. Um, but they may still use HTTP depending on the context and like, yeah, specific use cases. Answer and it kind of reminds me of that term you're using, Web 2.5, as kind of like that intermediary in between those two parts. Um, I think that is it for uh, that is it for questions, um, Jonathan. That was an amazing talk, and um, yeah, we will get ready for our next speakers. Thank you guys. Thank you again.